path that led to the Charles Lindbergh landing in Paris in 1927 actually began just after the Great War. The um, aviation was still, at that time, not, there really wasn't seen a future for aviation. I mean, it helped the World War, but it wasn't a decisive factor. Airplanes at that time couldn't go very fast. They could, they, they could fly about 100 miles an hour and stay up for two or three hours, um, carry one passenger, very uh, a few pounds of, of uh, equipment, bombs, or whatever. There really wasn't a future for aviation at the time, and a lot of people were thinking, well, what can we do with it? How can we expand aviation? Well, Lord Northcliffe, who was the uh, head of the London Daily Mail at the time, had always been an aviation aficionado. And he had sponsored, uh, put together a 10,000 pound prize in 1909 for the first person to fly across the English Channel. And he offered well, uh, Wilbur Wright a shot at that, but it was a Frenchman who did it, Louis Blériot. And the first plane that flew across the uh, English Channel and landed in Dover changed the world, because that was the point at which England was no longer protected by it. the roof had been taken off. England was now vulnerable. And it was a very important point. But Northcliffe and the London Daily Mail, uh, the London Express, uh, the Times all got together and they put together a proposal to try and see if anyone could fly from any point in North America to any point in Europe. And this led to an early attempt by two uh, Royal Flying Corps lieutenants named John Alcock and Arthur Whitten Brown. They were able to obtain from the Royal Flying Corps the newest and biggest bomber, a Vickers Venue, the largest plane in active service at the time. And they would fly from Harbor Grace, Newfoundland, to Ireland, the shortest possible distance between uh, North America and uh, Europe. So this was going to be an audacious jump, 1,800 miles, and it would take them about 18 hours. There's no way they'd be able to avoid flying at night, no matter what. They were going to have to do some overwater flying. One of them would pilot while the other uh, handled the maintenance and kept the engines working properly, and then they would switch off. Their flight was um, to be very dangerous because they'd be completely out of touch. There was no radio, there was no way to communicate with anybody. There were ships on the route that would watch, but uh, once they left land behind, they were on their own. But keeping uh, the story short for our purposes, um, they did make it and they did make it, but it was a rough flight. During the night, they encountered heavy fog, and there was icing all over the aircraft. And this is a biplane, and then there was a lot of surface area for ice to form, and there was moisture in the air. As the plane, <laughs> as the plane uh, rose uh, higher in altitude to get clear of the fog, ice started forming, and ice was forming on the wings, on the fuselage, on the bracing wire, on the strut. And it was slowing them down. It was causing really problems. So one of the, they would take turns stepping out of the cockpit onto the wings with an ice pick and chipping away at the ice, trying to clear it from the engine carburetor. And this is right behind the propeller. And trying to keep that plane in the air. It was very dicey flying. Well, after 18 hours, the Green Hills of Ireland finally appeared, and they looked for a place to land. There were no airports at that anywhere near where they were coming. They came in, and they hit a bog, they let notes over, and they ended up on the notes of the plane, but they had completed the flight. They were the first ones to fly nonstop between North America and Europe. And they received the, the prize from a young uh, member of parliament named Winston Churchill. <laughs> This sparked an entire wave of mania to fly the Atlantic, but airplanes weren't quite up to it. <coughs> However, dirigibles were. And the R-34, one of Britain's first post-war British airships, made a flight in 1919 from England to Lakehurst, New Jersey, the naval air station of Lake Lakehurst, New Jersey. Now, before Lakehurst became an airship base. And 
There were 31 men on board, and one of them was a major named um, Pritchard. And his job was when they came over the airfield that he would bail out <coughs> and land, and then he would tell the Navy ground crew how to grab the mooring lines and bring the ship in and tie it down. So when he did that, he jumped out. Uh, the altitude wasn't quite enough to give him a lot of time for the parachute to deploy, and he hit the ground rather hard. And immediately American reporters, you know what they're like, ran up to him and said, Major, Major, what is your first impression of the United States? <laughs> and he said, it's rather hard. <laughs> The R-34 returned to England, and that was the second transatlantic flight. It was, in fact, the first round-trip flight. But it would be a long time before an airplane could really take on the flight, a major flight. And that's where this man comes in. In 1919, Raymond Ortiz was a French-born hotel owner in New York. And he put together a $25,000 prize, which has always been called the Ortiz Prize, for the first pilot that could fly non-stop between <coughs> New York and Paris. The direction was not specified, whichever way you want to go. But it had to be non-stop between those two cities. Close to uh, 3,500 miles. Twice what Al Hawk and Brown had managed. It would be a 40-hour flight. And airplanes at that time what, were not up to it. It would be seven years before anybody made a serious attempt to take on, take the ORT prize. But during that time, there were a lot of advances <coughs> in aviation and all metal fuselages, derailing frames, the more powerful engines like the, the reliable Bright Whirlwind, the uh, Lerone Jupiter, uh, better navigation, airports, uh, all of these um, advances took place in that in that era. This was a very dynamic time for the, uh, the history of aviation. Most of what became uh, commonplace and, and uh, part of aircraft in the Second World War were developed in the years between 1919 and 1927. And 1927, of course, was the watershed year. The first attempt would be made by Tech France's top story case, Rene Fonk, the 75 victory. And Rene Fonk was understandably quite cocky about his flying ability and his ability to make the flight. And he was going to take on this job and he said, I'm going to have a plane built, it will be the best plane possible, I'll put together a big crew and I will make the flight. And so he obtained, through a lot of French and American backers, this was the big, um, this was made by Igor Sikorsky, the S-29. It was the only one of its type. It was three great big Lerone Jupiter engines and weighed 14 tons, 28,000 pounds. And half of that would have to be fuel. Um, the plane cost $105,000. <laughs> and he tried for a $25,000 price. I'm assuming Renee Fonk did not major in mathematics. <laughs> in any event, he wanted a big plane that could handle the, that could handle the flight, and Sikorsky was assured him that it could be done. However, it was not, uh, he was not going to take any uh, extra precautions like uh, Making, making sure that the plane was light enough and that it could handle it. He had three crewmen with him, a, a co-pilot, a mechanic, and a navigator. And the plane was heavily outfitted with mahogany paneling, carpeting, leather seats in the, in the cabin, curtains. They brought along a great big picnic basket from Demonico's. Uh, they had 100 pounds of letters that were going to be taken to Paris. They, he, they, were, they brought it on their luggage. He was not in the least bit concerned about weight because he felt that this plane could handle it. And he was very cocky about it on the, in September of 1927, 26th, excuse me, when he was getting ready to make the flight. <coughs> and he had said, uh, breakfast in New York, lunch in Paris. But that didn't happen. They took off from 
Roosevelt Field on Long Island, the longest runway on Long Island, 3,000 feet long. Now, it was nothing like the runway we're used to today, with concrete and lights and everything. <coughs> this was basically a great big long dirt strip. And to give you an idea how poorly people took, how not seriously people took runways at that time, there were three roads that ran across it <laughs> over long, through, um, on Long Island. There were great big dips in it. There were places where the mud was rutted and pitted. And so when uh, Font and his crew stepped on board and they began, they get started the engine, he needed 80 knots of airspeed, about 95 miles an hour to get into the air with this monster plane. And they're moving down the runway faster and faster. And he's trying to pick up speed and the crowd that is watching is a huge crowd. And he suddenly noticed a rooster tail of dust and dirt coming up from the right wheel. And then without warning, the plane cargo off the side of a runway, hit a ditch, and there was a flash and fire and explosion. And Jacob Ephamoff and Charles Clavier were killed. The Bonk and uh, Lawrenceford were able to get out. The first two men had died on the aerial road to Paris. That plane was just too big, too ambitious for the job. So nothing happened for a while, but then the new name entered the picture. Charles Lindbergh from Minnesota, born in 1902. Everything you read about Lindbergh is true. He was a very private, very careful, cautious man. He didn't like the press. He was not interested in publicity, but he enjoyed mechanical things. He enjoyed challenges. And he had joined the uh, air service shortly after the Second World War, First World War and uh, got his pilot wing <coughs> and then started flying the airmail out of St. Louis, between St. Louis and Chicago for the Robertson brothers, flying out of Lincoln Field, Nebraska and St. Louis. And the Robertson brothers were going to play an important role in his life because while he was making these long nighttime flights, Carrying the airmail. That was a very, very dangerous job. There were no real airports, there was no navigational system. You navigated by using iron compass, following railroads, you followed roads. You looked for some familiar town lights and so on. If you were flying in fog, you just navigated by your watch <coughs> and by looking at the stars, whatever you could. It was dangerous. Lindbergh became one of the first members of the Caterpillar Club which is the first people to bail out of an airplane and survive. But while he was up there, he had heard about the Fonk crash. He knew about the Ortiz Prize. He had plenty of time to think. He started thinking, what would it take to fly to Paris? How could it be done? And unlike Fonk, Lindbergh wasn't willing to take chances with a great big airplane. He thought, if I have a simple plane, a reliable plane, <coughs> single reliable engine, drip it down for so that it is nothing but the airplane, the engine, the fuel, and the pilot. I think I can make it. He was absolutely sure of his own ability to do it. But he needed money. And so he went to the Robertson brothers, his bosses, and Harry Knight, who was a banker in St. Louis, and four other men, all St. Louis businessmen. And he proposed the idea of of a New York to Paris flight. Now, he would not be the only one trying for this. There were other contenders. But they liked his attitude, they liked his spirit, and they said, okay, we'll back you. How much do you think you'll need? He said, well, I'd like to buy the right Belanca number one, um, which was a, a special plane that was designed by Giuseppe Belanca specifically to showcase the right whirlwind engine. And I think we can get it for about $15,000. So with $2,000 of Lindbergh's money, they put, the, they put the money together, and that begins our journey. So he went to Martin, Douglas, Bowen, Travel Air, Curtis, and Rome, <coughs> and he sent a telegram to each of them, can you construct a whirlwind-powered monoplane that will fly nonstop between New York and Paris? Only one company responded <laughs> to his telegram, and that was Ryan. And Ryan responded with, yes, we can do it. It would cost about $10, $580, and we can do it in 90 days. 
But before this actually happened, Lindbergh had <coughs> also contacted the people who had to write Polanco in New York. And he first went there by train and talked to the Giuseppe Polanco and the people who actually originally owned the plane. And he said, well, we're, we're perfectly willing to study the plane, but this is, this is dangerous. You're going to go by yourself. That's suicide. Uh, if you bring another pilot along, we'll consider selling you the plane. We don't want our plane to be connected with a disaster. So they wouldn't sell us to Lindbergh if he was going to be the sole pilot. He went back to St. To St. Louis. And then just as he was getting ready to leave for San Diego, he got a telegram from Giuseppe Polanco saying that the, the plane has been sold to Charles Levine of a Columbia Aircraft Company in New York in the Woolworth Building and he has been willing to consider selling the plane to you. So Lindbergh went back to New York, and he met with Charles Levine, who we're going to hear a little bit more about later, and Levine said, sure, I'll sell you the plane, but I have to be able to choose the pilot. And Lindbergh was stunned. He said, I'm going to be a pilot. And Levine said, well, I don't know anything about you, and I can't just have anybody flying my plane. And Lindbergh said, you mean so we buy the plane and the only thing we have for get for it is the ability to paint our name on the side of it? And Lindbergh said, yeah, that's about right. So Lindbergh turned around, he got back on the train and headed for San Diego. So this is where it begins, right here on in San Diego. Now this factory, which was an old fish cannery, located on the waterfront, I've heard various places about where it actually existed. The closest I've been able to come it is on the land where solar turbines is now. Between solar turbines and uh, where Teledyne Ryan is. It's in, it's in that area, right along the waterfront. It was a two-story loft and the planes were built in the, the, um, the wings were built in the upper loft where all the offices were and the lower bay where the fuselage was built. The company had been started by a man named T. Claude Ryan and Brenjamin Franklin Mahoney in 1925. And they had been uh, doing passenger service between San Diego and Los Angeles in a standard J-1, a World War I surplus plane. Airfare back then was $14, one way to send to Los Angeles, $22 round trip. Took about an hour. Interesting. It's about the same as it takes to drive there now. <laughs> yeah. And it's almost exactly the same amount of time it takes you to go to San Diego Airport. After you go to security, you climb into the plane, you fly to Los Angeles. By the time you get out and get your baggage, it's still an hour. But it's a lot more than $14. <coughs> By the end of 1926, Ryan had done very well with the company. They had designed a monoplane called the Ryan M1, which was highly Successful and had been doing the mail run all the way from San Diego, Los Angeles, uh, Salinas, San Francisco, San Jose, San Francisco, all the way up to Seattle with a perfect safety record. It was considered a very sturdy and reliable plane. But by the September and October of 1926, Ryan had said, you know, I want to move on to other things and I think I'm going to sell the company. So he sold it to his manager, Benjamin Franklin Mahoney. Because he didn't really see a future for the company. He didn't see that Ryan would ever really become a major player in aviation. So he sold the company. Talk about bad timing. Because in February 1927, Charles Lindbergh walked in the door with a check for $10,588.81 to pay for a special plane to fly between New York and Paris. The man who designed both the M1 and what would become the Spirit of St. Louis was Donald Hall, who interestingly had gotten his pilot wing after Lindbergh had taught him to fly in St. Louis. And Donald Hall was a very brilliant and forward-thinking aviation designer. And he took the basic Ryan M1 design and modified it. It would need to have, a, for a flight like that, it would need to be able to carry two tons of fuel, and it wouldn't have to have a longer, stronger wing, beefed up um, structure. And so they got to work putting together the idea for the new plane. So the M1 monoplane has that distinctive Ryan 
undercarriage with the uh, with the wheel coming off the struts, uh, coming down from the wing. It was very sturdy and it could take a lot of weight. But what Donald Hall did was to extend the wing. He took a 48 foot wing, made it a 55 foot wing, he strengthened the fuselage and strengthened the landing gear. And they had to make provisions for the extra fuel tank. There would be four fuel tanks in the wing. There would be a center fuel tank in the nose uh, that would carry a great bulk of the weight. Now, because Lindbergh had been an air mass pilot, and he had seen a lot of nasty crashes. He was very specific about where he wanted that fuel. Most of the time in those old planes, the fuel tank was behind the pilot. And the engine was in front. And he had seen crashes in which when the, the plane hit the ground, the fuel tank shifted forward and crushed the pilot between the fuel tank and the engine. He didn't want that two tons of fuel to be behind him. So he insisted that the tank be located in the nose of the plane. And this started the first of what became the third of St. Louis's most recognizable and distinctive feature. It was located ahead of him. And there is no windshield. He cannot see directly forward at all. That entire fuel tank is right there, and it's about this big, about 33 inches wide, and it carries almost two-thirds of the fuel, and the engine is attached to that. But there was a lot of questions. How are you going to see forward? Well, never had flown in the night. He had flown by in the fog. He knew how to navigate by the stars. And he wasn't worried about having to see forward. He said, there's going to be a window on either side, and all I have to do is side flip a little bit, and then I can look out the window, I can see ahead. But Mahoney insisted that he have some extra way of being able to see forward, and that led to the famous periscope, which is then actually in the next slide. The instrument panel is extremely rudimentary. This is actually before the uh, Line flying instruments were invented. He had a turn, yeah, I love that term, line flying. He had a turn and bank indicator. He could measure his fuel and airspeed and altitude. That was about it. This is very, very simple instruments. Fuel gauge indicators were not that reliable. They could give you an approximation, but he had to keep, he had to be very careful about how much fuel he used. So he would actually navigate, he would measure his fuel in the different tank by his watch and by the engine airspeed indicator. If he knew how much fuel it should be burning per hour, he could measure his fuel that way, balance the plane by switching between the tanks. Mahoney had insisted that he had some sort of way of being forward, and so this special periscope, which weighs about two and a half pounds, was installed on the left side of the view line, and the window, which he could see, was directly in front of him, and he'd be able to see directly forward. Well, Lindbergh accepted this as being a necessary evil, but what's interesting, he never used it. <laughs> it was completely unnecessary for his flying. Once it was in the plane and he started flying, he never needed it. Now, if you've been to the, the museum and you've seen the Ryan NYP we had in the rotunda, good idea to go around behind there and look in the open door of the cabin. That is a very small space. I have sat in it. I am six feet tall. Lindbergh was six feet three and a half. It is a little more than 36 inches wide, 50 inches from top to bottom, and the instrument panel was only 13 inches in front of his face. He was sitting on a wicker chair that was only nine inches above the floor, so his knees were almost up to his shoulders. And the control stick was right here. This is the cramped face he would have to spend 40 hours sitting in. It's a very tight spot. <clears throat> but he wasn't worried about comfort. As a matter of fact, one of the stories is that he didn't want to be comfortable. He wanted to always be uncomfortable because it would keep him awake on that long flight. So the 40-some people that worked for Ryan, we putting the plane together. Now they knew they were up against a race, but there were other contenders in the race to Paris. And they said they could build the plane in 90 days or less. But Mahoney had 
prevailed upon his employees to put in extra hours. Let's try and do it in less time. And so they were cranking out as fast as they could to, to get this plane finished and get it into the air and get Lindbergh to New York to see if he had a chance at being the first to fly. So the wing was built in the upper loft and it was lowered down by, by a crane through the roof of a box car, which was just outside the window. And then they lifted it off the box car, put the box car over, and then lowered the wing down. And then they started putting the plane together outside. Putting the wing on and attaching the propeller and doing the final adjustment and making sure that it was all together and then they would begin testing it. Now that wing is beautifully designed. It's, it's, there is a, uh, a wing rib at the museum right by the NYT that you can look at. And you'll see that it is made of very thin wood. It's almost like a Balsa airplane model. It's that thin. And yet, it is strong enough to lift two and a half tons of fuel and keep that plane in the air the entire time. They finished the plane in 59 days. And when uh, Mahoney asked Lindbergh, what do you want to name the plane? She said, there's only one name for it, and that is the Spirit of St. Louis. And he was asked, are you sure you wouldn't want to call it the Spirit of San Diego? Well, Lindbergh had been flying out of St. Louis, his boss, all the backers for the plane were in St. Louis. And St. Louis at that time, just like San Diego, was considered a cradle of early aviation. It was an important hub of aviation in the 1920s. So that's how the plane got named the Spirit of St. Louis, even though it was built right here. During the time the plane was being built, Lindbergh needed to plot his course figure out what he was going to take along. He was being very careful about weight. Unlike Pong, he was going to take no more than what he absolutely needed. What he was going to carry with him was his passport. No toothbrush, nothing. He, would, uh, he had a small life raft. He would bring along a flashlight. He would bring along a simple hacksaw blade in case he had to saw himself out of three plug. Some flares, some matches, some string. He kept his... Um, safety equipment, emergency equipment, as simple as possible. He was not taking any chances with weight. That's why he would not carry a radio. He did not want a coal pile on the wall. But he had to figure out the course. And the flight between New York and Paris, being close to 4,000 miles, required some serious navigation. The first thing he did is he went down to uh, Broadway and he went into a store and bought some charts of Europe and the Atlantic Ocean. He brought them back and he worked up in Donald Hall's office, laid them out, and he started with a mnemonic projection, which is a map that shows the Earth from directly above the North Pole, the geographic North Pole. And he drew a straight line between New York and Paris. Then he figured on the number of hours that, the, that it would take him in to fly, how far he could fly in an hour. He figured on an airspeed of about 110 miles an hour. And he marked off a series of dots on that line. Then he took and made the latitude and longitude uh, calculations for each one of those dots with one hour interval, and then transferred them one at, one at a time to a Mercator map. So each one of those dots was a one hour increment for his flight. And that Mercator map then showed what would be known as the Great Circle Route. The closer you fly to the North Pole, the closer together the latitude lines are, excuse me, the longitude lines are, and that plots your course. So he said, as long as I stick to this course, and every hour I adjust my compass heading a few degrees to the right, I will follow that great circle course, and it should take me right over Ireland, Wales, down the Seine River, and the Paris. But he was taking no chances. As a matter of fact, the chart that he had, that he was going to be marking off his course in. He had it cut down until it was nothing more than a strip chart, about 40 inches long and maybe eight or 10 inches high. And he cut that down and folded it up, just like a road map, and kept it on a small clipboard. That's all he wanted. He wanted nothing else, nothing that would be flapping in the wind, nothing that would take up a lot of space. So between May 1st and 3rd, 1927, he took the plane up to where, um, Near where Miramar uh, Marine Corps Air Station is now. 
cap hernia. And that's where they tested the Spirit of St. Louis. He started testing it with heavier and heavier loads of fuel to see how, the, how long it would take the plane to take off with loads of fuel, uh, testing its uh, <coughs> aer aerodynamics ability, how much uh, rudder and thick it would take to, uh, to fly and control it. And he was very pleased with the plane's handling capability. He said it handled very much like a sports car. It was a really uh, comfortable plane to fly. So shortly before he left for New York, they posed, the entire writing was posed for this picture. And this was, you can see Lindbergh standing in the middle there, he's a tall guy. But there's another person in the picture that does deserve some note. And he was here in San Diego at the time. About six from the right in the photograph, you'll see this little guy looks like a teenager, wearing coveralls, like coveralls. His name is Douglas Corrigan. A name on the belt? Ron 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 That's right. That Douglas Ron Ray Corrigan. He came from Texas. And he worked his way around the country as a welder and was working for Ryan at the time. He was one of the people who did the welding of the frame and the fuel tank for the Theater of St. Louis. And he was so excited about what this plane was going to do. He was already thinking, this is what I want to do. I want to become a pilot and I'll get my wing and I'll buy my own plane and I want to fly and, and set records and be famous. Well, we all know what happened. In 1938, he took a beat up Curtis Robin that he had managed to buy and modified himself. He was on a real shoestring budget. And he had not been granted uh, the right by the CAA to fly from New York to Paris or even New York to Ireland because they didn't think the plane could do it. They were sure that he'd never, he'd never make it. And he said, all right, I'll, I'll fly for a flight from New York to Los Angeles. And then he took off in the fog and disappeared. And 23 hours later, he landed in Ireland. And he swore he'd just gone the wrong way. <laughs> he wrote a book called That's My Story and I'm Sticking to It. <laughs> but before Lindbergh left New York, Another name popped up in the story. The first people to take actually try to make the flight were Commander Noel Davis and uh, John Alcock. Excuse me, um, David Wooster and Davis. Excuse me, Captain Wooster. And they had been sponsored by the American Legion. And they purchased a, uh, a Keystone Pathfinder bomber, which they painted the name American Legion on it. And they were, they were based in uh, Virginia, Langley, Virginia. And they started testing the plane with successively heavier loads of fuel. And about the time they were thinking, OK, in a couple of days, we're going to fly to New York, we're going to go to Long Island, and we'll begin preparations for the final flight. And they were working with the plane. They put the heaviest load of fuel they'd ever tried, and they made a test flight to take off. This was in front of a lot of spectators. The press was hounding all of the contenders at this, at this time. And shortly after they took off, they reached an altitude of about 30 feet, and then without warning, the plane simply <coughs> nosed over and crashed into a swamp and killed both pilots. The death toll is now up to four men and nobody has reached Paris yet. They didn't even reach in the runway. Mm -hmm. On the other side of the Atlantic, two Frenchmen, Charles Mendeser and Francois Pouli, <coughs> were also trying for the Ortigue Prize. Since Ortigue had not specified no east or west, they were going to fly from Paris to New York. Charles Mendeser and Francois Pouli had both been aces in the Great War. The Nunga Sir had been the third ranking ace. He was a darling of the girls and the bourgeois. They had the photographs of him. He was a very dashingly handsome man. But since the war, his fame had faded. He had tried a movie career, which had uh, gone nowhere. He would made several bad investments. He was deeply in debt. He needed to do something to recapture the glory, the fame, and the money. And on his new four fighter during the war, he always had a big black heart painted with a skull and crossbone in defiance of death. He met up with Coley, who had already done some record-setting flights over the Mediterranean, over Africa, to be his navigator. 
And they were, uh, they approached a man named uh, Pierre Lavasseur, and Lavasseur provided a, uh, a PL-8 bomber design, a medium bomber design that he was trying to sell to the French Air Force. And this would be modified into the plane, it was known as the Lazo Blunt, the White Bird. And they would fly from Paris to New York, leaving Paris, uh, the Bourget Airport, on the morning of May 8th. They would fly north along the Seine, across the, across the English Channel, over Wales, then over Iceland, Ireland, then over the Atlantic, then to Newfoundland, basically exactly the opposite of the Fort Lindbergh would fly. And they took off, the, big, the plane barely made it into the air, it was a very difficult takeoff. And they, only about a thousand feet up, which was all the altitude they could gain with all that fuel, flew north along the Seine, over the English Channel, over Wales, the Irish Sea, <coughs> Ireland, and then left the Irish coast behind around 10.30 a.m. on May 8th. They were never seen again. Right up there with Amelia Earhart, the disappearance of Francois Foley and uh, Charles Lancaster is one of aviation's greatest mysteries. Nobody knows exactly <coughs> what happened to Walt the Walt Blanc. But the French people were so thrilled and they were so sure that they would make it that on May 9th, the Paris newspapers <laughs> had the story that they had made it. <laughs> In New York, People are still watching and waiting and waiting. All the way through the afternoon of May 9th, there's no sign of them. Every time a seagull showed up in the west of the eastern sky, there it is! Nope, that's not them. And they've never been seen. Six men have now died trying to make it between New York and Paris. But in New York, Commander Richard Byrd, who had already flown over the North Pole and was already quite famous, was at least the hangar at Roosevelt Field for his attempt to fly the uh, uh, Fokker tri, tri motor, which was called America. And he was ready, as soon as the weather was right, as soon as he'd done enough testing, he would be making the flight. And then the other man that turned up was Charles Levine, the same guy who uh, would not sell the British papers to. Uh, the right to London to Lindbergh. Charles Levine was known as the flying junk man because he made his, made his fortune in uh, military uh, surplus after the war. The closest person I can come to today that would give you an idea of what Levine was like would be Donald Trump. <laughs> A very ambitious and narcissistic businessman who was absolutely sure of every decision he made was gold. And he was really impulsive, didn't worry about what other people thought, did not uh, think about the consequences. He owned that right flanker, like and he had two pilots that he was considering, Clarence Chamberlain and Bert Acosta. Now, Pete is really brief, but it is interesting. He wasn't sure which one he wanted to have fly the plane to Paris, his plane, which was called the Columbia. And he said, I will decide on the morning of the flight, they can pick their name out of a hat. That's an awful, <laughs> chancy thing to put your life on. But he liked Acosta because Acosta looked like a pilot. He was a very handsome man with dark brown eyes and wavy black hair and very dashing looking with a mustache. But Chamberlain looked something like an accountant and he had blue eyes, but he was a much better pilot. And Levine wasn't crazy about him because he had been told that blue eyes don't photograph well and they don't look good on film. <laughs> and so a Chamberlain wasn't quite photogenic enough. Anyway, we'll get back to Levine in a bit. But these two men were in place in uh, Long Island when Lindbergh arrived on May 12th after flying from San Diego to, to St. Louis, St. Louis to New York. It was actually a record setting flight. He did it so fast that the plane handled very well. So he arrived and set up quarters in a hangar on Curtis Field, which was just across the highway from Roosevelt Field. And that's where he met the other two contenders. 
So we have Lindbergh, Chamberlain, and Bird. They were rivals, but they were all pilots, and they knew how to get along, and they were willing to help each other. Matter of fact, Bird even suggested, I'm going to let you use the runway at Roosevelt Field because it is a longer runway, and it would be a safer takeoff. So even though he had leased it, he was going to provide it for both Lindbergh and Chamberlain. Well, after Wilson and Davis had crashed, there were also a couple of other incidents. While Bird was testing the America at one point, the, uh, the brick caught, and the plane flipped over under his back, and Bird broke his wrist. The plane needed repairs, and he needed <coughs> some medical attention. So for a time, the America was out of the flight. Claire Chamberlain was testing the right Balanca <coughs> during some flights for the press, and one of the wheels came off. It broke loose from the fuselage, and he flew around for several hours using up fuel until he felt safe enough to make a landing on one wheel. He made a very, very good landing. It was no damage at all, but at the, the wheel had to be, the strut had to be replaced and some wing tip damage repaired. But just like that, the three contenders, Wooster Davis and uh, Bird and Chamberlain, were no longer in the front. Lindbergh had suddenly become the dark horse and came up out of nowhere. And now the six men have been killed. Everybody is thinking that Lindbergh is a dead duck. There's no way he can make the flight. He's going to do it alone. They started calling him the Lone Eagle, Lucky Lindy. He hated those names. He was always Slim or Charlie to his friends. And the press hounded him like you wouldn't believe. They would not leave him alone. They asked him the most inane question. Do you carry a rabbit's foot? What's your favorite flavor of pie? Do you have a girlfriend? They even asked Mrs. Lindbergh, his mother, a school teacher from Detroit, Mrs. Lindbergh, how do you feel knowing that your son may be dead in a few days? This is where Lindbergh began to hate the press. And of course, after his son was kidnapped and murdered in uh, 1932, that made it even worse. But this was the beginning of his hatred of publicity. He was not interested in publicity. All he wanted to do was the chance for the challenge of flying to Paris. Could it be done and could he do it? So Lindbergh spent all the time he could checking the map, checking the weather charts. He's looking at the, uh, the Navy Weather Service, making phone calls, sending telegrams to Newfoundland. I need weather reports. He needed to have clear weather for at least the first half of his flight. And whether he would have uh, Clear skies over the Atlantic, that was, that was a, a hardly, he could not be sure, but he had to take the chance. Bird and Chamberlain were not in the picture at that time, because Bird was still waiting for the plane to be repaired. Chamberlain's plane was grounded because somebody had sued Charles Levine and wouldn't let the plane take off. So right now, Lindbergh took in the lead, and he's waiting. And on the night of May 19th, he was convinced to go into town to a, uh, to a show called Rio Rio from Broadway, and where he could watch and just relax for a little bit. He sat in an easy chair on the wing because he didn't dare go into the audience. He would have been mobbed. So he watched part of the show, and then somebody came up and tapped him on the shoulder and said, I just heard from the weather service, it looks like it's clearing up. So before the show was over, Lindbergh bolted, and he said, let's get out there. I want to get the plane ready. The plane was partially fueled. And then with towed, tail first, the, uh, the tail skip was lifted and put into the back end of the truck. And with the police escort, was towed backwards across the highway to Roosevelt Field. The plate at the end of the runway, and Lindbergh began his final preparations while the plane was fully fueled with two and a half tons. He put on his flights, his ordinary street clothes, even wore tie. Ordinary street clothes with tall boots, put his flight suit on it, on over it, stuffed cotton into his ears to protect himself from the engine noise that would last for 40 hours, put his flight helmet on, had a bag with a couple of sandwiches and a thermos of coffee. He climbed in, checked all the instruments, closed the door, started the engine, and waited until the engine revolution settled down. And he looked at Frank, Frank Mahoney and 
we have a people from Ryan, a people from right, uh, from the right engine corporation. And they said, well, I guess I might as well go. Mm -hmm. and that's all there was to it. There was a big crowd, there were hundreds and hundreds of people watching <coughs> this, mo this historic moment. So the sun was just coming up, and he started rolling down the runway. Now, as I mentioned, Roosevelt Field is muddy. And he's picking up a lot of mud and dirt, and the wheels are grabbing, and the, the ground crew is pushing as he's moving down the runway. They're pushing the plane, trying to get up enough momentum so that the, the lift will start to take over, and that the plane can lift off. He uses up a quarter of the runway without reaching more than 40 miles an hour. And about two-thirds down the runway, he has a marker with a, with a stick and a, an handkerchief that would be there to mark where if he passes that point and he's not off the ground yet, he will cut the engine because after that is a line of tree and power line. He's got to either be in the air before that or risk crashing. He's going faster and faster and trying to lift into the air. If you've ever seen the movie Spirit of St. Louis with uh, Jimmy Stewart, I, have, I highly recommend it. It's a very good movie. It does a good job of showing what it was like, how hard it was for him to lift that plane into the air. And he's bouncing, he lifts off, and then bounces down again, and lifts off. And he passes his marker, and stays at it. Pushes the, the throttle to full, and manages to claw his way into the air. He cleared the power line by 11 feet. And then he was on his way. Jimmy Stewart did a very good job of being Lindbergh for the movie. However, Lindbergh at the, Lindbergh at the time was uh, 25 years old. James Stewart was 46. But he still did a very good job with the role. And uh, what you see in the film does a good job of showing what it was like inside that cramped cockpit. How tight it was, how uncomfortable, how primitive it was compared to today's flying. So after leaving Long Island, he worked his way up past Cape Cod, Massachusetts, Boston, and out over Maine, headed for Newfoundland. Hour after hour is passing. The whole world is watching. Once he's taken off, the telegram went out all over the world. He's gone. He's taken off. And as long as he's over land, every time he passes over any city, somebody will send a telegram back saying, he just passed over, he's on time, he's on his way. But once he leaves St. John's Newfoundland behind, he's on his own. There is nobody out there to tell what's happening. He has, um, he, at the 14th hour of the flight, he expected to take about 40 hours altogether. The 14th hour of the flight, the sun is setting behind him. And it is now nighttime. And he is using, there's a skylight right over his head, and he's using that to navigate by the stars, as well as by his earth conductor compass. And by keeping the north star over his left shoulder, he always knows that he is basically headed east. But um, he takes his last sun sighting just, after, just, just before sunset, and he, notices, he knows what his approximate course and uh, position it. Because once he's out over the ocean, the wind, the current, the wind, and um, a lot of other variables can make it difficult for him to navigate accurately. <coughs> so once he takes his last sighting, that's it. He's got to hope that he stays on his course. But the 14th hour is a critical one for him because now the temperature is dropping. He's got relatively clear sky, but he's now and also entering big fog banks. And he has to stay somewhere so that he can stay above the fog to navigate by the stars. And then occasionally he has to go down below the fog to watch the waves. Because the waves, the white cap, will tell him which way the wind is blowing. And if the wind is blowing from the north, he knows that he has to apply some left rudder to counteract the wind to keep him from pushing him south. But when he climbs high, the ice starts to form on the wing, just like it did with Alcock and Brown. And at one point, he notices that his engine is cutting out, it's coughing. And he takes his flashlight and leans out over the left, out of the left window, and he 
we heat the all the wing strut and the uh, the fuselage, the wheels are covered in ice. And that scares them because it means ice is clogging up the carburetor and could kill the engine. So if he go, goes down below the fog and he flies it within maybe 100 feet of the water because the warmer air there will break off the ice. It's a very tense moment because he has to stay at it until the ice breaks off enough so that the plane will be lighter. He cannot afford the extra weight. All through the night, he's getting more and more tired. Because even though he took off, he had tried to get some sleep that night before, when he, after he had come back from the theater, he really wasn't able to sleep. By this time, he'd been awake for over 30 hours. And he still had a long way to go. When he reached the 28th, 20th hour, he is sure that he is now the halfway point. It jumped as far to go back as it is to go on. He doesn't really have any other course to go. He has to keep flying. He's not absolutely positive of, of his uh, position because the earth inductor compass froze up during the night. All he can do is keep his eye on Polaris, keep making his heading changes every hour, and adjust the fuel. <coughs> All he can do is hope. And the night dragged on, hour after hour. He's so tired, he's resting his head on the control stick. He doesn't dare fall asleep for obvious reasons. And then the sun begins to rise over the west, the eastern horizon ahead of him. It's still empty ocean. Nothing around but empty ocean. And then on the 28th hour, something miraculous happened. He flies over a boat. Then he sees some seagulls. And he leans out the left window. And he sees green land. He's not even sure if he really sees it. When he wrote his book, We, about the spirit of St. Louis, his flight was the spirit of St. Louis, he said he was sure it was a mirage. It could not possibly be Ireland. It was much too early. He was sure that he was lost. It could be Iceland. He could have flown um, as far south as um, Spain. He had no idea where he really was. But as he got closer and closer, he started noticing land features, and big rock formations, and a bay that looked familiar. And he pulled out his chart and checked it against the map of Ireland. And he found out he was flying over Valencia and Mingo Bay. After 28 hours of flight, he was only six miles off for him. <laughs> he passed over the coast of Ireland and right at that moment, the world knew. The telegrams went to Paris, they went to London, they went to New York, everywhere. He just arrived over Ireland and now he flies across Ireland, picked up the course of the Shannon River, goes over the Irish Sea, Passes over Wales, and as he crossing over Wales, the sun is starting to set behind him again. And now beginning the, toward the end of his second day in the air. And he's been awake for well over 40 hours. He's dead tired. But he still has to make it across the, the English Channel, and he picks, finds Lahab and he heads for the mouth of the Seine River. He works his way down the Seine River, and looking for Paris. This is a computer generated image of what Paris, the center of Paris, looked like in 1927. This is what he would have seen. And he sees the Eiffel Tower and starts circling it. He knows that Le Bourget is to the northeast of Paris, about 20 miles outside of town. So when he circles the center of the city, takes up a heading to the northeast and begin flying in that direction. And as he is, he, thought, he sees that the roads are choked with cars, headlights by the thousands, all heading in the direction, the same direction. He doesn't know what it is. It doesn't even occur to him that these are people that are coming to see him. He thinks there's a festival, a fair, some sort of parade. He doesn't know what's going on. He's been out of contact for a long time. But the whole world is, defend, is descending on the Bourget at this point. He comes over the field and there's a spotlight. This was back when airports were 
identified by having the name painted on the roof of a hangar so a pilot could tell what airport they were flying over. And he sees the Auger Paris painted on one hangar. He knows he's in the right spot. And he sees the apron where the planes are tied down. He sees lots of cars, lots of people, lots of airplanes are tied down. But he's got to find a runway in the dark. It's miraculous. For some strange reason, the French didn't turn the lights on. <laughs> and he is headed to a big, dark area. And he said, that's got to be the runway. And I'm going to line up a parallel to the hangar. And I'm going to try and set down. I hope that I, that I hit it right. And he heads for this big, black area. His wheels touch down. And he comes to a stop. And shuts off the engine. And the pilot is definitely. You cannot do anything but just sit there. He's been in the air for 33 and a half hours. He's in Paris much sooner than he expected to be. Because the plane flew much faster than he realized. And his ears are ringing from the noise of having been inside that cold, rattling cockpit for all this time. And then the noise starts, and there's a roar that he cannot, he has no idea what's happened. But 40,000 people broke through the line of gendarmes. Um, the um, gendarmes tried to hold the crowd back, but they just shut them down and ran for the plane. And the plane is absolutely packed with people shoving in right up against him and trying to reach in and touch him. Of course, he doesn't know what's going on. He's completely bewildered by this. By this circus going on outside. And they pulled the door open and dragged him out and put him up on their shoulders. And he's in danger of being crushed from the adulation of the crowd. Um, and he sees that people are reaching into the plane and they're pulling out souvenirs. His log would disappear. It has not turned up to this day. Uh, people were taking pieces off the engine. For two years. And he yelled to one of the gendarmes, stop them, stop them, they're trying to they're damaging the plane. And the gendarme said, We'll get the crowd under control, we'll take it to the we'll take it to the hangar. And then um, somebody pulled his flight helmet off and stuck it on the man who happened to be standing there and said, This is Lindbergh, this is Lindbergh. And that poor man was yanked up off his head. <laughs> and carried off to the hangar where the uh, American ambassador and the French consul and everybody was waiting to greet him. And the man said, no, 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 I'm not Lindbergh. I'm a reporter. I'm a reporter. And they said, no, of course you're Lindbergh. You're just tired. You don't know what you're saying. <laughs> well, when the real Lindbergh was finally brought in safely and the identity identified himself, that was the moment. And at last, the uh, things were put under control. The spirit of St. Louis moved into the hangar. Lindbergh took a few minutes to identify it, with some minor damage. But outside, there were 40,000 people watching. This will give you an idea of what it looked like. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> yeah, so he was taken to the American Embassy and he slept for 12 hours. And he gave him a suit of clothes, which didn't fit. Uh, the pants were too short. If you look at photos of him in Paris, the cuffs are about five inches too short. Um, but he made, he made a couple of speeches, and this was the beginning of what he called the hero business. And he was wine and dining all over Paris. And suddenly, he was the most famous person on the planet. He made several flights in the spirit around Europe, to uh, around France, and then to England before he would be returned to the United States. The, um, the flight he made to Croydon, outside London, the crowd was waiting for him. The Bobbies were there holding the crowd back, and he was approaching the runway, and again the crowd broke through. And he saw them pouring on the runway directly in front of him. And he had to gun the engine and take off again to keep from plowing into them. And he flew around until things were restored and the crowd was pushed back and was, uh, held back. And then he landed. And as soon as the plane stopped, again, they swarmed onto the runway after him. Everybody wanted a piece of him. 
and he was forced to run to the control tower and climb up the ladder to keep from being trampled. And when the American ambassador showed up, got, got him into the car, and drove away with him waiting, he had said, he said, I don't mind them being around me, I just don't want them touching me. He said, I can't stand it, I can't stand this crowd. He spent some time in England, and then the USS Memphis was sent to, was part of the Atlanta Squadron, was sent to England to pick him up, a, a heavy cruiser. And a special box was built for the Spirit of St. Louis, partially disassembled, and placed in a crate on the Memphis deck. And then uh, Lindbergh would be taken to Washington, D.C. But while he was on the way back across the Atlantic, something strange happened. A plane flew over. And this was Clarence Chamberlain in the rifle on for Columbia, headed for Berlin. Charles Levine had said, well, I don't care about Lindbergh's flight. I, I'm going to do him one better. We're going to fly to Berlin. Even longer. That would be much more famous. How many of you remember that flight? <laughs> no, really. The, um, he decided to go along as navigator, even though he wasn't a navigator. He decided to go along as a co-pilot, even though he'd only had a couple of hours of flight training. Chamberlain, Chamberlain would do most of the flying. It was a disaster. They crashed twice in Germany, trying to find Berlin. And they finally did make it after 53 hours of flying. It was a record flight, no doubt about it. But hardly anybody remembers it. And that was the junk man journey. So when the Memphis put in at the Washington Navy Yard, and he stepped down, there were at least 100,000 people waiting for him. And that began a major, major turnaround in Lindbergh's life because he would never again know privacy. He would never again know the peace and solitude of just being an ordinary public citizen, private citizen. And he met with, he met up with President Calvin Coolidge. He was given the uh, Distinguished Flying Cross, one of the very first people ever to receive the Distinguished Flying Cross. He was given medals and awards. And for the next year, Lindbergh did nothing but public appearances, wine and dine across the country, he was taken to New York, and was the recipient of one of the very first New York ticker tape parades, which ended up with 1,800 tons of paper scattered all over the ground uh, in New York. And when Lindbergh was given the keys to the city, the mayor of New York said, now you're going to have to provide us with a cleanup crew to sweep up the mess. The spirit was put back together, tested, and Lindbergh began a 48-state air show, essentially. He flew to every one of the, of the 48 states, this was before Hawaii and Alaska, of course, and went to air shows, went to county fairs, promoting aviation with the spirit of St. Louis. And after one year, he, uh, Finally finished up, and he met Raymond Ortiz, and he received his check for $25,000. Mm -hmm. And he paid back his backers, and then the Spirit of St. Louis was donated to the Smithsonian. And it now rests at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And that's where it is today. Back to San Diego because San Diego was the birthplace of the original Ryan NYP. Several reproductions have been made, two of them turned up in the movie, one is in the, um, one of those planes is at the uh, Missouri uh, Historical Society in St. Louis, and the other is right here in San Diego. And when you go to the Air Space Museum, take a look at that plane, that is as close as you can get to the real thing. And if you have a good friend who's a docent, like me, uh, I will even let you get through the fence and let you poke your head into the, the cabin. And you can see how small that plane really is and how primitive it really is. And yet it managed to help him make that flight. It's interesting that that plane is directly across the rotunda from the Apollo 9 command line. Talk about the beginning and the future of aviation in one place. 
It's an interesting story that when Lindbergh, when uh, Apollo 8 was getting ready to make its flight to the moon in December of 1968, uh, Charles and Ann Lindbergh went to uh, the Kennedy Space Center to meet with the astronauts. They met with Norman Lovell and Andrews. They also met the backup crew, three men named Armstrong, Aldrin, and Colin. And Lindbergh was fascinated about what these men were going to be doing. And he, he asked them, how much fuel does that Saturn rocket burn? And Bill Andrews, who was the command module pilot, said, 20 tons per second. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Lindbergh said, you know, in the first second of your flight, you are going to burn 10 times more fuel than I do all the way to the Paris. <laughs> but there is another interesting little tidbit to the Lindbergh story. Remember that crate I told you about that the spirit of St. Louis was put in on the Memphis? Well, that ended up in the hands of a Navy admiral who decided to keep it as a souvenir. He moved to New England and had it converted. It was a pretty good sized crate. I mean, it's almost the size of this room. And he had it converted into a little office for himself on his estate. After he died, it was sold off and went through a couple of different uh, owners and finally ended up at, believe it or not, the Lindbergh Crate Museum. <laughs> this came in. So you can go there and see the crate that the Spirit of St. Louis put in. Everybody wanted to cash in on the fame of the Charles Lindbergh at first game in 1927. So that's the story, and I hope you all enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs>